everybody, it's Ron from Ron's Computer Videos. How are you guys doing this evening? Um, <clears throat> I had something that I actually wanted to share with you here as uh, Marchitosh sort of comes to a close. And it's um, me finishing up on a project uh, that I started forever ago and just have not been able to get finished. And that was to restore my original PowerBook 150. I love this little machine, it's so cool. Um, it has a lot of limitations compared to some of the other 100 series PowerBooks, but uh, it also has kind of a lot going for it too, in my opinion. So I thought that um, I would go ahead and get my 150 restored, so that way that I could share it with you guys here during the month of Marchintosh. Uh, let me go ahead and let's switch over. I've got some slides to show you. Let's do that now. All right, here is my PowerBook 150, um, and it's all up and working, and I'm really excited about that. Uh, but it was kind of a rough process, and it's just because there are some limitations uh, with this machine. Uh, the PowerBook 150 is the very last 100 series PowerBook that used uh, this case design, which was kind of originally called like the 140. Uh, 170 case design just because those were uh, the from the first series of power books and they were the first ones to use it so the uh, the power book 150 is sort of a weird machine uh, because it is a combination of a lot of the things that went into the duo series which came um, kind of later after the original power books so that sub notebook uh, line that apple had and it also combines uh, some other features with uh, like the PowerBook 190, which is not really uh, like a 100 series PowerBook, even though Apple kind of kept that uh, naming convention. It's kind of more closely related to like the PowerBook 500 series, just in terms of uh, design and such. But the 150 is very special. It's the very last machine to use this case design. It was the first of, the, of these PowerBooks to use IDE for the hard drive to try to save a little bit of money over the SCSI uh, drives that Apple uh, typically packed in with those machines, uh, the, the other 100 series PowerBooks. But uh, there are some other limitations. It has a uh, passive matrix display, but it's four bit grayscale. So that's nothing maybe to, you know, shake a stick at. Uh, it does use uh, duo style RAM expansions, which maybe are a little bit more expensive, but uh, especially these days. But back then, uh, you know, you had uh, maybe more machines that you could kind of share RAM with. And uh, it does lack uh, some of the normal ports that you might find on the back of some of the other power books, but it was cheap. Uh, they were like $1,600 when they were brand new. And you could get them at places outside of Apple's kind of normal um, kind of ecosystem for some of those sales. Like you could get pick them up at like Sears and Best Buy and or not really maybe Best Buy, but like Montgomery Ward and, and, and stuff like stores that would have been contemporary to that era that sold um, uh, Performa machines. So the PowerBook 150 kind of fit in with that. But anyway, <clears throat> here's mine uh, completely up and working, but it totally took a long time to get there uh screen repairs uh recapping things all that ah oh, man what a pain in the butt but let's let's talk about storage because really those little cheap ide hard drives that uh, apple shipped with those things uh didn't really survive <clears throat> they're no good these days so you have to think about what your options are going to be to add some mass storage to it so that's what i really wanted to talk about this evening as maybe as a focus so let's go through the slideshow so if you want to know how to open uh, a PowerBook 150, I suggest that you check out my Macintosh PowerBook 150 shenanigans video that I streamed uh, earlier this week. Uh, it was uh, sort of a, just a fun uh, uh, teardown of a PowerBook 150. I mean, I take it apart and put it back together like 50 times because I had to go through and just test different things to uh, see exactly what was going on. So um, as you see, I have a modern solid state hard drive installed there, but there's lots of different options to be based on uh, kind of what you want to accomplish. So uh, let's say you go ahead and you have your PowerBook 150 apart and you have the original IDE drive removed and you're gonna wanna add uh, a new modern storage solution. So what are, what are your, really your options? Well, what I opted for was one of these IDE to MSATA adapters. 
you can pick them these up on uh, AliExpress. You can pick them up on Amazon. You can pick them up pretty much anywhere these days. Um, they're pretty generic. This one right here uh, actually uh, gets to the, the root of a problem <laughs> that I had with this project, where if you try to use larger uh, drives, um, you, you will kind of bump into some things. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. But um, another option, you can also DOS Dude 1. So Colin Mister has those uh, brand new uh, IDE SSDs for uh, different machines. Uh, he's making these. There's available in his store. This is a, a, a 64 gig model right here, uh, just as a, a um, just as an example. Um, and I've used these on several projects. They work amazing. So really, really fast. So definitely, definitely check those out as an option. Uh, but what happens if you do try to use those bigger drives? Well, there's a limitation because on the PowerBook 150, because it was the very first machine that Apple uh, was using those IDE drives, uh, there is a very specific utility that you have to use. It's called HD format uh, that was included with your uh, system disk to ship with the system. Uh, and unfortunately, that utility just initializes the drive. It does not allow you to partition like maybe uh, some of the later uh, utilities uh, would allow you to do. Uh, like drive setup and all that because drive setup uh, kind of for some of those later machines uh, supported IDE so you could go through and you could format those on the other machines well so why not just use um, uh, you know that on the PowerBook 150 because for some reason I guess it doesn't recognize the controller inside the PowerBook 150 so you if you're trying to do it strictly on the PowerBook 150 you are going to run into some issues because HD format will not allow you to partition. So if you have a 64 gig or a 128 gig, something like that um, uh, little uh, drive in there, uh, it's gonna be too big for, even if you could format it, the second you try to copy things to it, you're gonna get errors because those machines just simply can't address uh, drives that big. So what are your options? Uh, as you can see this error message right here, it's like, yeah, you gotta have a power PC. Come on, what are you thinking? Trying to do this on a 68030. Uh, your options are probably something like this. If you don't want to uh, enlist the help of another Macintosh that has IDE, uh, they make, like Saiba and different companies make these compact flash to IDE adapters. Um, here's one right here. Uh, basically, you can just pop, like, you know, because you have to think that, like, there's a two gig limit on a partition that a 68030 is going to be able to read. So you buy a two gig compact flash card and slap it in there. You can format it, you can use HD format and have no problems at all. Now, what's nice about these is they actually have on the other side, another compact flash slot. So you can slap in a second compact flash card. See, they're kind of sandwiched there together and you will have two, like a master and a slave uh, drive setup so that you should be able to, I, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to, uh, you should be able to, um, Go ahead and format those as two two gig partitions, four t four gigs of storage. I don't know that might be enough for whatever you're trying to accomplish, but for me, I needed more storage, so I had to go through and enlist the help of a newer Macintosh that had IDE. So what I was able to do is just pop the drive in, uh, just using a two and a half inch to three and a half inch uh, IDE adapter. Uh, I was able to go through and format it. I, I just created like four partitions. Uh, in my mind, I wanted a two gig partition for the operating system and any kind of scratch files or anything I want to do. Uh, I need a two gig partition to hold all my apps. I need a two gig partition to hold all my games. And then I wanted a blank two gig partition just for future shenanigans. So that's what I ended up doing. So on that modern Mac, I went ahead and used HD, or I'm sorry, um, uh, a drive setup to go ahead and format the hard drive and make those partitions. And then at that point, I went ahead and I popped it back out and put it back into uh, the PowerBook 150 so that I could go ahead and boot it up using a, a Blue SCSI version two uh, and then do the operating system install. Now, something that's nice about Blue SCSI version two is it does all that uh, CD ROM drive emulation. So you can actually put like an ISO file on there named properly according to, in, in accordance with how the blue SCSI uh, is gonna look for that drive image. And what it will do is it will just show up like a drive and boot from it, super convenient. So Apple has that Apple legacy software recovery CD. Um, thankfully the PowerBook 150 can boot system 761. 
So all you got to do is just make that, you know, CD6 uh, died ISO, uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, even with the wonky SCSI in the PowerBook 150, it just sees it, boots, and you can install the operating system. So as you can see right here, um, I'm just going through. This is uh, basically what I decided to do is just to make sure that I could turn off 32-bit addressing if I wanted to play with something that specifically required that. Uh, I just decided to do a 7.5.5 7 install. And it takes just as long as you think it would on a 68030. So it took a good long time to go ahead and get... Um, get that installed but then as soon as that was done uh, immediately you're into the 7.5.5 upgrade and that basically takes you to the end of uh, 7.5 uh, sort of that that lineage of software but it's nice because uh, again you can turn out you got 32-bit addressing you turn it off but you have a lot of the modern features like a clock and 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 other kind of window shade and stuff like that that you might have on kind of the newer operating system so uh, optimizing for t uh, it, you know turbines to speed, uh, atomic batteries to power. Yeah, it took it took a while, but eventually it finished up. So that was kind of nice. And then at that point, I went ahead and um, uh, decided I was going to go ahead and copy over all my stuff because I also mounted some uh, images of like my apps and my games and and utilities and tools and stuff uh, with the blue SCSI as you can kind of see there uh, on the right. And then what I did is I just manually copied them over and it took maybe about an hour to copy two gigs. So it's it's no speed demon compared to like modern machines, but I, I don't think it was unreasonable. So took a little time, got it all copied over. And when it was done, uh, I did hit a snag. And that was because uh, if you try to rebuild the desktop file on a 68030 on a two gig partition, it's going to take a while. And I kind of gave up after like 20 minutes or so because I was anxious to see this thing actually boot and work. So I pulled the drive back out for just a second, popped back in my modern helper Mac with IDE and just let a modern Power Macintosh rebuild the desktop file. And then it only took minutes. So it wasn't too bad. So after that, of course, you have to do some benchmarking. It's 2023. You got to benchmark everything. So uh, this is the, uh, the, the new solid state drive. Uh, with 32k cache disk cache enabled which is uh, sort of the base one if you zap the parameter ram on that machine it's not the default setting but uh, like as, as far as mac os is concerned but it's the default setting based on the pram of this machine because you got to kind of keep in mind that these machines originally shipped with like 7.1 with a system enabler or something like that so uh, you know, there and and four megs of RAM, so you definitely had to be a little more svelte on your uh, settings and stuff. So, but that's 32k. That's 32k cache. Here's the default setting for Mac OS, which is 384k. Absolutely no difference. Maybe like a little hiccup here and there, but n not enough to to justify using all that RAM. So I would say uh, you can leave it at 32k. It's probably fine. Um, uh, I mean, but setting it to like two megabytes or something like that, if you had like a big memory card, it won't make a lick of difference. All right. So you got all that done. What can you do with it? I guess you could sit here and watch it boot, right? <laughs> so, so that's what we'll do real fast here. We'll go ahead and we'll let that boot up. And, uh, you know, it, it doesn't look terrible in my opinion. I mean, it's, um, it's taken a second right there at the end. Uh, just because that is kind of the deal with a lot of the 68030 machines, that last step there on 7.5.5. Hey, at that point, we're booted. That was like 30 seconds, maybe? That's not that's not too bad for a machine of this era. But what can you actually do? You got an operating system on it, that's that's fine. But what can you do? Well, you do, you, um, you actually go through and you do a little bit of uh, testing first. You make sure that you can actually shut the machine or put it into sleep and bring it back out of sleep. Because uh, that's a really great test on these like 100 series or 100 series machines, just because if there's something wonky with your RAM, there's something wonky with your hard drive, um, and and even back in the day uh, with the original IDE drives, that was kind of an issue on these machines. Sometimes like you would have like a timing issue, and it would not work. Uh, you would actually it would just lock the machine when you tried to go to sleep and come back out So as you saw I went ahead and went to sleep came back out of sleep and then opened up Macintosh HD uh, To actually see that it would uh, actually read the drive afterwards. So very satisfied that it's actually working But what can you really do with it? You do what I do which is 
you test the machine, you play some Prince of Persia. Yep, I love this game. I love this little machine. Uh, let me see. Do we have audio over here? Oh, come on. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So that's pretty cool, right? So I do love some Prince of Persia. Um, but a big test, something I definitely wanted to make sure worked, was Creepy Castle. This game is actually kind of a good test of the sound chip in 68030 machines, just because it, um, yeah, it's a good test of the rant or the uh, sound chip just to test for compatibility. Cause there are a lot of machines that just won't play this at all. Um, or it'll play the game, but you won't get any audio. I know that there are uh, a lot of newer Macs that are like that, but if you never play creepy castle, it's kind of like, um, like uh, Frankie's Dungeon, Wolves in the Woods, you know, it's kind of the, the natural progression of that because um, Reactor bought it and then turned it into some other stuff. But anyway, uh, what else we got here on our slideshow? Uh, is that it? That might be it. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty much that's it. I was able to go through and get that drive installed and I had to use a helper machine, but um, but it went okay. And, uh, and I had a lot of fun doing it. So... Um, thanks very much for taking a few minutes just to uh, let me wrap my head around what's going on with this, this PowerBook 150, uh, this 150 repair and such. Um, it, again, it was a really like a lot of fun. Um, these are really cool machines. Oh, another thing that they cheaped out on, um, they don't have a back uh, flip down panel and stuff. It was just all exposed. That's why a lot of these end up with damage over here by the modem port just because, you know, banging it around on stuff and all that. But um, it also is a little different because it has the, um, it's got the Apple logo kind of centered here in the front. Um, all the other ones have it like down in the corner. So, but you know, other than that, it's pretty much the same machine. So that's really it for this evening. I want to thank you guys for taking a few minutes to hang out with me. And uh, as I say, Apple II forever.